All right, you curious, you courageous hurly-burlyites. Time to summon all that courage, because today on the pod, a pollster panel, laying bare the current state of politics in the U.S. and Canada, the remarkable Trump comeback and election victory is only a week and a half in the rearview mirror. I want to look at some of the factors that drove that result and how that compares to Canada, whether those same conditions exist in Canada, all of those conditions exist in Canada, or what's unique about Canada. And all that through what does the data say? So with me to examine those questions and the follow-ups that cascade from there, two of the best in the business, David Coletto and Kyla Rennell and Fitch, both appearing on the podcast for the second time. David is one of Canada's best known public opinion analysts and social researchers. He's the founder, chair, and CEO of Abacus Data. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Calgary, and he's an expert on voting behavior in the intersection of public public opinion and public policy. Not only that, David teaches at the graduate program of political management at Carleton. Kyla started her career with me at the Gandalf Group, but I think it's safe to say she's now successfully flipped the mentor-mentee relationship. She's a pollster, data scientist, and educator, holding a Master of Science in Analytics from the University of Chicago and a Master of Political Management from Carleton, where she teaches political data management in the Clayton H. Riddell Graduate Program. In 2021, she founded her own full-service polling firm, Relay Strategies, based in Ottawa. Oh, she's also a proud daughter of Humboldt, Saskatchewan. (laughs) Kyla, David, welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, David. So the conceit of this episode is that I know that you both uh, have looked extensively at the American data and results, and you've also very, very conversant with what's going on in Canada. So there's a million theories about why the election in the States went as it did. Um, I want to run through the ones that interest me. And you can tell me whether you think they were important or not in the U.S., but what I also want to know is, does that dynamic exist in Canada and to what extent and to whose benefit? Okay. So let's start with men moving more conservative. So men tend, generally tend to tilt conservative in any event, but it seems to have been more pronounced in this election campaign and notably young men moving conservative. So Kyla, if I could start with you. How much of a factor do you think that was in the U.S. election? And what is that look like in Canada? Yeah, I think um, definitely a factor, but I think an overblown one. I think there's a lot of um, sort of panic in the, in the response and, and uh, a feeling that especially young men have become much, much more conservative. Um, I've spent for, for the past few years, I've worked for a Democratic polling firm um, in the U.S. And really for the last year, I've been especially focused on understanding the perspectives of young men, because this is what we've been hearing so much is young men are becoming more and more conservative. Um, I would kind of flip it a little bit. And it's that young women are becoming so progressive. And as a point of comparison, young men look conservative, but men tend to be and tend to skew conservative. And if you look at kind of the the context of the ideological perspectives of young men relative to men older than them, they're actually more progressive. It's just that they are men and men tend to be a little bit more conservative. Uh, The one area that I will kind of give more space or credibility to is that you see um, young men are just, they're very polarized. I I think of them as like very much a product of the current political environment and the online discourse. So young men are really progressive or young progressive men are really progressive. Um, Their attitudes don't look that different from, from progressive women. It's just that there are a lot more of the progressive women. Um, And young Republican men in the U.S. are very conservative. And that is actually where you are seeing a lot of the kind of backlash against, I would say, gender progress. Um, A lot of discontent with young women, a feeling, um, I had had asked this question um, about a month ago, asking um, what young men think are the greatest problems facing young men and boys and young, young women. The number two item that Republican men choose for one of the greatest problems of, of a dozen different, different things that are facing young women is that they're being brainwashed. So there is this feeling among 
young Republican men. Um, just th th that is where you see this kind of like big divide and, and kind of the, the themes of the manosphere sort of pop up. All right. Okay. Thank you. David, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think, um, I actually think there's a bigger factor. I think I disagree with a little with Kyla in that, yes, you know, young women are very much progressive, but I do think men have, have moved, uh, young men, than they would have been, you know, when I was in, in that age court. And I'm talking about 18 to 29 year olds, right? And when you look at that, that cohort, both in the United States and in Canada, I think you see the same, you know, trend happening in, in the UK, a lot of Europe is that, that there is a, a, a sizable portion of them, I wouldn't say all of them, that I have, I think they have a sense that they don't have a place today. Um, the economy isn't working for them. Um, they're having a harder time around questions around masculinity. This is go beyond even my expertise to try to get at what, what the psychology is there. But I do think that the data that I see shows uh, a clear difference, right? Uh, just looking at Canadian data, I, I brought together uh, four of the surveys that we did since September. So I've got a data set of 10,000 respondents. And I went deep in looking at the differences between young men and young women. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, young Canadian men have a, Donald Trump's favorability is plus three in Canada. It's minus 48 among young women. That is as big a gender gap as I have almost ever seen on, on a political figure who, yes, is polarizing, but, you know, for a young audience, <laughs> um, to, to see such different uh, views around gender tells me something's happening there, right? And they are not more likely, interestingly, to say the country's headed in the wrong direction. They're not more likely, um, you know, to have a, a different set of issues than younger women. But I think they're experiencing both the economic, social, and political environments in different ways that are, that are pushing them almost in opposite directions uh, in, in a lot of ways. And so I think that's part of the story of what happened in the United States. I don't think it's enough to explain Trump's victory. But when I look at a state like New Jersey, for example, and it only went for, for Kamala Harris by four points, right? Or New York, where we saw the, the margin close, those are clear indicators that people who have probably not voted for Donald Trump or any Republican for a long time did uh, last Tuesday. And I think younger Americans are a big part of that story. Well, to follow up on that, don't you show don't you show Polyev at about 45 points among 18 to 29 year old men? I don't think he I've is, seen that. I don't think I've is, seen that in an election before. Young men are the demographic in which he is the most popular, except for conservatives, right? If you take out the partisan tinge to somebody, that that demographic is the best predictor of whether somebody's going to have a positive or negative view of Pierre Polyev, right? Um, and they are not more likely to have a negative view of Justin Trudeau than older Canadians. But if I had told you, David and Kyla, two years ago that Justin Trudeau would be more popular among those over 60 than he is among under, uh, those under 30, including women, mind you, uh, you'd say that's crazy. That's not how we understand Canadian politics today. So something's going on. And I think the economic uh, situation is a big driver to that. Yeah. Just to clarify, I wouldn't, the gender gap was enormous and a very significant factor. I just think that a lot of the way that it is described is sort of in like the cartoonish Joe Rogan type division. And I think that a lot of the divide is actually more pronounced in between, especially among young men, young women in is more pronounced in Canada than it is in the United States. Not necessarily because I think Donald Trump presents a figure and, and because their, their system is so much more polarized than ours, that creates a certain degree of sorting. Um, and in Canada, I think that the uh, barrier to entry to be a conservative looks different because Pierre Polyev is not viewed as as extreme of a figure as Donald Trump. And I think that the economic discontent is so pronounced among young people, especially among young men, that I think that is leading to why um, there's a lot more openness to conservatives and also to just self-identification as a as uh, a conservative ideologically aside from their vote, which I think is the really interesting thing longer term. Like people can park their vote temporarily, but if this is having an impact on how they view themselves just as a voter moving forward, that is the, the thing that, um, yeah, just has more long term and, and interesting implications. So if you were to try to sort out, I, I, I think I know what your answer is, but I do want to kind of understand the interplay 
of uh, economics and identity. So um, it's a tough time to be a young person generally. I don't know that it's a tougher time to be a young man than a young woman. Young men might think it is, but I doubt that that's objectively true. Um, and so there's an economic thing here, but there's also what David, what you were talking about, which is the, are men valued? Or I'm always told I should be different. I should restrain all of my instincts and impulses and everybody else but me needs help. Uh, in this society. What's the balance there in Canada, in your view? Well, I think it's, I think it's, if I had to put a, a, a numeric balance there, I think it's still 70% economic and 30% identity. I, I don't think it is all driven by that, but the economic makes the identity part feel more present, right? Because if things were going pretty well, if, if young people felt that they could buy a home, um, if, you know, and, and you can't forget that, that it takes a long time for gender roles and values to evolve. So even if we know that younger Canadians, particularly Gen Z, have way more progressive values when it comes to a lot of issues than any generation before them, there's still an embedded view that if you're a guy, you probably should be able to be the one who helps pay most of the rent in a relationship or, um, if, you know, or, or carry more of the, the burden in terms of the household. Now that's not, that's not needs to be true. And in fact, women we know are more likely to get a post-secondary degree in Canada now if you're under the age of 40. Um, they're, they're probably more likely to be uh, higher income earners than men. So there's some statistics that show that those gender roles have shifted, but I don't think the expected gender role has fully shifted. And so in a tougher economic environment where the cost of living is just bearing down on young people in every single way, I just think it accentuates that identity part of it and makes men feel even less um, able to, to deliver the expectations that so many people, their parents, grandparents' generations may have had on them and maybe still do. Kyla, anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah, I think that there's an expectations gap. And even if some of these things, when the, when the economy felt better for younger people, maybe it wasn't triggering these same feelings because you were in a position to, I don't know about provide, but to, to financially succeed um, or have it not be that different than what you would have anticipated, say, what your life would look like if you were in high school when you tried to think of what your life would look like when you were 28, for example. Um, now I think there is that growing delta between what, what people thought their lives would be like. And I think maybe young men are socialized in a different way than young women where we aren't, young women aren't expected to be, then we're not raised to be breadwinners or to think of ourselves in that way. And maybe even that's like an outdated way, but I still think it's like, it's a part of the culture. Um, and I think that's a big part of um, why you do have that kind of um, some men looking for answers in other places and, and validation in other places of that experience, because there is that, disappointment and I think shame I think that not having the economic future that you thought that you would I think that is shame provoking um, and more so for men than for women <clears throat> and why don't young women in Canada follow their counterpart their male counterparts to polyev well they are uh, not to the same extent but they are voting conservative at a much higher rate than they would have in 2015 um there's the conservatives are still winning among young women which is like that is a profound difference um and yeah and the the liberals from my latest polling and in third place among that cohort like that is an untenable position if you are the liberal party to be polling that far behind among young women and to have the conservatives doing that well okay so there's there's something going on with young people then it's not just young men well, it's every so age cohort, right? Yeah. Like it's, it is a, it's a true wave sweep. It's everyone. <laughs> it's hard to point out like this, yeah. this versus that. It's, it's, it's the, across the board. Right. Okay. I want to hearken back a couple of decades to a less gray version of Hurley, one who aspired to having actual biceps. When I was in the thick of government, there was nothing more satisfying than when new policy started to work the way it was supposed to to fix what was clearly a problem. We've been talking here for the last few weeks about the rise of copper theft in Canada and the havoc it wreaks on our communities and public safety. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, believes industry and all levels of government must collaborate to address it. 
On the provider side, there's new early warning surveillance technology and other enhanced security measures they're investing in. But on the government side, let me be blunt, we need stricter penalties for thieves, some actual deterrence, new policy. The best practice examples are out there. Copper theft was costing the British economy an average of £1 billion pounds a year. In 2012, British Transport Police launched Operation Tornado to trace sellers of scrap metal and make it infinitely more difficult to pass on illegally obtained copper and other metals and punish those who try. In one year, a 51% drop in the crime. The UK also requires everyone who sells scrap metal to show proof of identity. Many of our provinces have also implemented this, but not all. It would also help if all provinces followed the lead of New Brunswick and Alberta, banning cash-in-hand payments for copper cable and scrap metal. Untraceable crime is successful crime. Finally, provincial scrap and metal dealer regulations need to be updated. Thieves are getting creative. We need to cut their source of resale. Updating these regulations will help do just that. Hurley Burleyites, I feel I'm on pretty solid ground when I say nobody wants to put up with essential service outages because thieves are cutting copper wire. It's a problem industry and policy can fix, and we should do it. Okay, so let's flip the let's let's flip the uh, the angle here. The Democrats appear to be counting on a tsunami of women to counteract this male trend toward Trump. And they heavily emphasized issues of special appeal to women, uh, whether that be choice uh, in particular. Uh, They profiled women um, uh, and in their campaign in a way that the Republicans certainly did not. And that turnout did not happen. Right? So when you think of the liberals here in Canada with their feminist government, with their pro-choice positioning, with their climate agenda, um, they should be expecting the votes of women in this country. And they're not getting them, are they? Why not? Well, Well, Kyle, I'll I'll, I'll start, but I I, I think you've got a really good answer to this. But I, I, I look at my data and I say, David, it's because those issues that you just listed aren't as salient uh, among men or women right now, right? The, the issues are the cost of living, housing, and, and health care. And the sense of scarcity that I describe that has kind of taken over the, the public's mindset, right? The things I need in my life, some of them I used to expect I could get, harder to get, more expensive. And if I have them, I'm worried I'm going to lose them, right? Women more likely to, particularly older women, to think about health care as something that's incredibly scarce. And if I lose my family doctor, I don't know where I'm getting another one. Um, but the same sense of scarcity is around housing and, and other forms of, of whether it's food, energy, you name it. And so I think that just completely overwashes any attempt by the liberals to try to frame at least the choice right now in a different, a different sense. That, um, that that sense of scarcity is universal, um, which is why, as, as Kyla mentioned earlier, we are seeing a blue wave wash over the entire country across every region and demographic because that issue affects everybody. And it's such a hard issue for any incumbent government in its ninth year to overcome. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a, it's a condescending proposition, right? Like why aren't women treated like economic voters? Women are economic voters. Like we are, we spend money. Single women are more likely to be homeowners in this country. All of these things. It's like treating, um, half of the population with kid gloves that if I say that this is a feminist budget that therefore that should feel warm and tingly and it's why why wouldn't the issue set be the same maybe you know maybe a little bit different and I would say to caveat I don't I don't consider abortion in this category in the United States this was a very motivating issue for women Um, If that issue hadn't existed, one, we wouldn't have seen young women vote in the way that they did with the margin that they did, given the, especially among progressive young women, their concerns about the war in Gaza, Um, but they came out for Harris because of abortion. Um, And, and, and it was a, the top voting issue among Democrats, period. So I, I would not consider that into like the woman camp of like, you know, 
a, a, like a lipstick feminism or something like that, that, that is something different. But I think not treating women like economic voters is missing the point of what women care about. And, and oh, where yeah, we and are think, in this economic... Okay, so world. that's a really compelling point. But I want to fight with you about, about abortion. Because I was told ever since the Dobbs decision, um, and we saw evidence of it in the 2022 midterms, but I've been told even when Biden was still the candidate, that this was going to motivate turnout against the Republicans, that this was going to be the issue that drove the election. This was not the issue that drove the election. And, and, and the Democrats, I mean, in one respect, the story of this election is not that more people voted for Trump. They actually didn't. It's that fewer people voted Democratic. It's there's 9 million missing Democratic votes from Biden to Harris. So instead of Dobbs supercharging turnout in this election, more women stayed home and didn't vote, come out and vote for Kamala Harris than voted for Joe Biden. I would actually say maybe, I, you know, definitely the, the 9 million um, missing Democratic votes. I hear you on that. But also, what would the vote have been without abortion as a risk? Um, I, like, it, it was... Without that and without Donald Trump as the candidate that Kamala Harris was running against, the Democrats would have been in an absolute desperate situation, um, given where perceptions of the economy are. Right. Okay. That's a, absolutely correct. I agree with, entirely with that. So let's get to the meat of this matter. And David, you have recently been opining on inflationitis. Uh, for governments and uh, scarcity, you see, I read all your shit. I read all your shit. Okay, um, and um, and uh, inflationitis and scarcity. So, how does that how does that play out here? And does it have to play the same way it did there? And I was thinking when Kyla was talking about how David Axelrod had said once that. You know, when they were running against Romney, when Obama was running against Romney in 2012, they uh, had a bad economy and people weren't happy. And they changed the subject to whether or not you had a good economy to who was your best advocate in this shitty economy. Was it the hedge fund owner, uh, Romney, or was it the Democratic fighter for you, Barack Obama? And in that way, they got themselves through a bad economy. Um, why can't the liberals play that same card here? Well, I think there's a few factors. One is, um, you know, running for re-election in the U.S. after four years is different than running for re-election for the fourth time after a decade. I think, yep. I think there's a, you know, just that alone um, probably makes it even harder, especially if Justin Trudeau is liberal leader in that, in that election. And, and just time you know, uh, has an effect. You know that better than anybody. Um, and yes, you, you, I you, do. Do you want to see the you, scars? I'll start taking yeah. my clothes off. <laughs> so, so I think that's, <laughs> that's one big factor. But I think, I think importantly, though, and this is where I think, to your point, Obama was able to make that case because he was able to, 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 to change the narrative and the frame to a place where people believed he was there and he could stand up, he had empathy, he, he could defend the interests of the key people he needed to to come out and vote. In the case of Justin Trudeau and the Liberals right now, their brand is so the opposite of defending your right to, to afford your life. Um, you know, on your, on your other podcast, David, you talk, you know, Corey tonight talks about the carbon tax. Just this week, you know, uh, Scott was talking about it too. And that's, that is the truth, that, that as much as people... Um, you know, as much as most people get most of the money back, they don't believe it. And uh, if, you, if you stand by a government that feels like it hasn't defended uh, your ability to afford your life, um, then, it's, then that's the biggest hurdle. I, I mean, I made comparisons in the piece I wrote about why Doug Ford, and in Nova Scotia right now, um, Tim Houston, the premier there, is looking like he's going to be reelected, maybe with a larger margin than he got in his first election, and they will buck the trends. I mean, Doug Ford still has a road to go before he's secure in his re-election. Re but literally everything that Doug Ford does is, is decided and thought through the frame of, is this good for taxpayers? I will do zero 
zero decisions that are perceived to be an increase in their cost of living. I mean, I know there are uh, supporters of a bottle deposit system in the province of Ontario who are befuddled that Doug Ford won't move it forward, but he fundamentally believes it's, it's going to be seen as a tax on people. That deposit they're going to pay is going to be seen as a tax. So he refuses to even think about that. And so he's, he's protected himself in a way from this inflationitis by being so focused on that that you can't question his sincerity um, and, and, and look to the alternatives and say, well, there's a better option um, uh, on, on that. And Bonnie Crombie's trying to, 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 to fight on that, that field with a tax cut proposal now, but I think she's still up against the perception that Doug Ford, if that's, if that's the most important issue, you will likely think Doug Ford is more likely to be on your side. Kyla, I'm just going to say this. Neither Trump nor Polyev is going to do anything about affordability. There is nothing they can do about affordability. Do people think that they will make life affordable, or are they just punishing the people who've presided over this period of unaffordability? Um, I think they look different in Canada and the U.S. I think that there is a segment of the American population that are like true believers of Donald Trump. And they really think that he created the economy um, that, that, that existed when he was president and that he's a good businessman and that he's going to recreate that environment. I don't think we have, there, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, Polyev has, you know, some fans. I think there's much less of that like cult of personality around him. I think that he is, more so viewed as the natural alternative to Justin Trudeau and a fighter at that. Um, but when I tested what people think the actual results will be of uh, a poly of government, most people don't expect that much change. And I think that goes back to just a lot of the cynicism that people have around politics and their politicians and not necessarily having that high of expectations, but where he probably differs a lot in, in perception versus Justin Trudeau is at least being focused on those issues. And so maybe there will be marginal gains um, and that will be better than at least someone that, that as people perceive it, deny that it's a problem or ignore it as a problem or don't speak to it or talk about it. It just is not as much viewed as something that, Justin Trudeau is hyper fixated on. So, in case you haven't noticed, seaports on the West Coast are shut down. Basically, dock workers issued a strike notice and management locked them out. The Port of Montreal, meanwhile, is effectively operating at half capacity. Weeks of rotating strikes and labor action have disrupted critical cargo shipments into and out of eastern Canada. All this amounts to a garrote applied to the neck of the Canadian economy one that is tightened with every day that passes. Nearly a billion dollars worth of goods is affected daily. Soon enough, mountains of backlogged sea containers will begin to stack up. For the moment, Canadians might not be noticing the knock-on effect, but it is happening. This will cost money, and guess who will pay the bill? It should be no surprise that our sponsor, CN, is a big stakeholder in all this. CN trains cannot, for example, deliver and offload products to ships in Vancouver or Prince Rupert, or accept incoming cargo. CN's intermodal terminals cannot accept cargo destined for the Port of Montreal or BC ports. And soon enough, thousands of Canadian businesses and their employees will feel the burn. This is not opinion, it is fact. If this situation continues, it will lead to mill shutdowns, furloughs, and higher prices to consumers. The domino effect will spread through the economy. We really don't need this. It's an own goal. CN believes we need to rethink the labor management ecosystem within our supply chains. And meanwhile, get back to the bargaining table. There's nothing more durable than a negotiated settlement. And let's face it, that's the usual outcome. The only question is how long the game of chicken should be allowed to go on. What do you think, David? Is Polyev uh, a candidate of hope for people, or is he just benefiting from anger? There's, there's some hope for some people who, who look at their outcomes and say it, it can't get worse, um, and so it can only get better. Um, there's an optimism in there, but I do think a lot of it is punishing um, the incumbent, right? I look at the correlation between how people feel about Justin Trudeau and their likelihood to vote liberal, and it's almost a perfect correlation, right? Like, you, you almost... 
there are no people who say I like him who aren't voting for him or people who don't like him who are, right? Like it's, it's, it's so, so strong. And, and that tells me it's a lot about throwing the bums out than, than embracing the poly of agenda, which is why I think the conservatives, as much as they are likely to win the next election, are setting themselves up for uh, a really difficult post-election period where their expectations of delivery, even if people aren't fully believing that things can fundamentally get better, there's still going to be an expectation, right? Um, and you're already seeing evidence in the UK of how fast um, a government that, that represented change has now become as unpopular as the, the, the folks who were there before them, right? And, and, and the New Statesman, uh, an interesting article called, you know, the, the Labour victory in the UK, a loveless victory, that it was simply a rejection of the old uh, guard and not really an embrace and love of the new one. And I do think that there is a subset of the new conservative voter who isn't, who isn't in love with Pierre Polyev, who isn't excited, enthusiastic, but what's pushing them there is very much um, a, a desire for change and a rejection of, of, of Justin Trudeau's agenda right now. Yeah. yeah well, if, I, they're in, if they're in the 40s, they're definitely getting the votes of people who are not inherently conservative in Canada, right? Yeah, I would, absolutely. I would add to David is a, a lot of people don't know anything about Pierre Polyev. It's not even just that they're like kind of mild is they just know that he is the person running against Justin Trudeau. And this is kind of in the su subject of my rantings to all my friends and family is that election results are not necessarily the best indicator of a broader public opinion. You can overread what it means and what it means about people's values and, and what they want. And I would say that horse race is kind of the same. You could look at where Pierre Polyev is in the polls right now and assume that that means people love him. And that's not the case. Um, it's just they really dislike Justin Trudeau and they're really ready for change. Yeah. Many governments overread their mandate. Right? Um, I mean, just, just David, the, quickly, the glue holding this new conservative coalition together is Justin Trudeau um, and, and their, their feelings towards him. It is not much else. So the moment he is out of the picture, which is why I've argued, not because I think he needs to go, it's more of looking at the data. I say if the liberals want a path back, they need to get the thing that's ripping their own coalition apart and holding the conservative one together out of the way. And until that happens, I don't think there's a reason for them to, to be broken off from that, right. from that new preference. So, Coletto, there will be a lot of liberals listening to this show. We're going to talk about leadership now, so let me just get this out of the way. Do you have any personal animus toward Justin Trudeau, or are you a conservative or something? I'm not. Um, in fact, you know, only a few years ago, everyone thought I was a liberal because I was uh, <laughs> you know, with Drew Sanderson, and now... <laughs> You know, uh, you know this. This is part of the game where you, the people who like your numbers think you're with them and the people who don't think you're against them. Um, right. But no, I have no, I've never met the prime minister. I don't know him. Um, I, I just look at data and try to give advice based on what I see. Okay, I believe that. I just want to get that out of the way. Um, so Thanks. let's talk about it. So we now know, we now know that uh, the Biden campaign people were sitting on data that showed that Trump was going to win 400 electoral votes. It was just going to be a massive beating. And it puts great context for me around Nancy Pelosi sitting in Biden's house and saying, get Mike Donlin on the phone, right? Because um, it was just, they were bullshitting him, obviously, about what the situation was. But so Harris lost, but closely, right? Very different race than 400 uh, electoral votes would have been. So if Trudeau were to leave, what's the potential for the Liberal Party? So, you know, again, it's first I'm just going to put a big asterisk about everything I'm going to say, which is like, David, you're BSing me. Like, it is hard to, to, to you know this, and we all know this, we're all pollsters, to measure hypotheticals, right? The public, to, to Kyla's point exactly, isn't giving this a lot of thought. They haven't imagined what you know, the next leader might look like, but all they know is what they don't like about the current one and, and the situation. And so when we ask people, would you be, you know, people who are not open to voting liberal today, and by the way, only about 38% of Canadians say they're open to voting liberal. That is as low uh, an accessible voter pool that I have seen probably going all the way back to 2011, like when it, when it bottomed out, right? And, and you can imagine it's about that. 
So you now have so few people relative to where the Liberal Party normally is, which is a party that should get at least half of the people. You ran 55, 60 in the 90s, by the way. Exactly, right? That is that, that, those days are long gone, uh, at least in the current scenario. And so when you ask people who say, no, I'm not open to voting Liberal today, well, if Justin Trudeau stepped away, would you be? That number goes up to 30, uh, sorry, to 45, right? So it adds about five to seven points. Still not, not that much the, over the 50s. But that's in the context where people are just, you know, not really, um, can't feel what it's like to not have the prime minister in the forward view, right? So I do think, my, my, my answer is always, it's hard to predict how people are going to react to it. But I can imagine the sense of relief that will come over the country the day after that the prime minister announces, if he does, that he is stepping down and won't be running in the next election. Because I think for the first time in many years, the, most of that public will be able to say, okay, so what's next? And it doesn't mean that who comes after Justin Trudeau is going to be any better or have a better shot at making the Liberals more competitive. But at least there's a chance that they can. And if I'm a Liberal, that is my hope. If I'm somebody who doesn't agree with Pierre Polyev's agenda and, and doesn't want to see the Conservatives with a massive majority government free to do whatever it pretty much wants, that's got to be in the calculus as you think about the future. We need to build millions of homes, but we're already facing an energy shortage. As demand grows and we look to diversify our energy mix, we need to explore additional options for clean, renewable energy. Here's how Canada's forest sector is helping. By converting biomass such as wood chips, sawdust and bark, materials that might otherwise be considered waste, into bioenergy, our forest sector is creating a sustainable energy solution that can help reduce reliance on fossil fuels. In forest-rich countries like Sweden, district heating systems powered by biomass are already widely used to heat entire cities. And even here at home, the Atacocan power plant in Ontario was recently converted from coal-fired generation to 100% biomass, providing renewable energy that feeds directly into the grid and can be dispatched whenever Ontario's power system needs it. As government explores ways to move to cleaner sources of energy, incentivizing industry to adopt wood-based bioenergy could transform the way we do business, providing renewable, reliable energy for both urban and remote communities, while helping other parts of our economy decarbonize. And because Canada is recognized as a global leader in how we manage our forests, Canadians can be assured that transition is being scaled in a way that will keep our forests as forests forever. Our world is changing. So is Canadian forestry. It's time we made the most of this renewable resource. For more information, visit forestryforthefuture.ca. So, Kyla, let me phrase this slightly differently to you. Because even though you're just as data-driven as David is, you are a partisan. You are an, a, a self-proclaimed partisan liberal. And so, I am one also. And so, my fear about the election is that the Liberals are going to get less than 20% of the vote. My hope under a different leader would be that we would get 30% of the vote. How likely are either one of those prospects, do you think? I feel like um, I'm going to say something that is like sacrilege as a partisan, which is like, we always want to say, you know, we're going to win, we want to win. There's also an alternative route for the Liberals right now, which is like, we need to lose less bad. <laughs> we need to continue to exist. That's and, what I said about my hope is 30%, right? Like, yeah. And um, I think that the addition of a, of a different leader, it, it creates that path. I think I, we, right now we are in a dynamic where people want um, an outlet, like, the, like they want to punish Justin Trudeau. And if you take away the, the necessity to, I don't think the feeling and, and the approval of the Liberal Party itself is not as negative as it is for Justin Trudeau personally. I think him stepping aside takes away some of that like bloodletting, some of that, that, that feeling. Um, and then instead maybe creates the opportunity of like, maybe we don't want to give Pierre Polyev the keys to the kingdom. Maybe it gives you license to vote for, um, the liberals, it starts to change the calculation. I don't know that it makes us 
makes the liberals win, um, but might create an environment where it's, you know, not a decimation. <laughs> and, and David, can I just say one thing? I always, I always say this too. The liberals barely won the last two federal elections, right? It doesn't take much, like a 20 point uh, margin is, is cataclysmically bad, right? But a five point conservative win might not make, might give them a majority, but it might depending on the split of the vote and where it happens. And so what, I mean, what does, and this is the question I would ask of the prime minister, what does, why do you believe you can do what no incumbent in the world has done, which is increase your vote share from the last election, um, given that you have been in office for 10 years and you're facing this, the same kind of economic and social pressures that all of them have faced, right? Kamala Harris she wasn't the incumbent, but actually was very, very successful. I think, you know, um, she, her vote, the Democratic vote share dropped, but not nearly as much as the average we've seen in other parts of the world. Uh, David Eby held on, but, but saw a significant drop in, in his vote. So there are, and I, I actually think that Tim Houston may be the exception to the rule um, that we might see in 2024 where an incumbent actually gains, gains vote share. But again, what, what is it that Justin Trudeau has um, in his back pocket that, that allows the party to do what no one else has been able to do. Right. Well, since we're on the subject, what kind of leadership are people looking for? It's pretty easy to look at the U.S. result and look at a situation where the economy seems to, a lot of people feel the economy is not working for them. The world seems like a more dangerous and unstable place with Russia, China, wars going on in different places. And that Trump was the strong man leader. And that in times like that, people look for strong men leaders. And they don't have to be male, I guess. You can imagine Margaret Thatcher. But that type of, that type of leadership. Um, is, that a, is that a correct conclusion, Kyla? Is that, and, and, Paul, and does Polyev exemplify that in Canada? Yeah, I, I think to an extent. I think that he does bring that. I don't know that. People think of Pierre Polyev as like a strong man type, but he's definitely assertive and he's definitely confident. Well, and I, think I don't know whose guy, data, Kyla, just a second. I don't know whose data I saw and it would have been probably one of your twos that showed that people think Polyev much better equipped to deal with Trump than, than Trudeau. So just carry on. Yeah, I think, um, I think, again, I think it's in a, in a context of what are Justin Trudeau's perceived weaknesses. And then I think that Pierre Polyev fulfills some of those. So they're kind of like a perfect, he's, he's sort of the perfect answer to Justin Trudeau. And do I think like a very Trumpy figure would be as, as successful? Like we have our own, we have our own politics and we have our own culture. I think that Pierre Polyev is probably almost as far to that persona as, it, it, I don't know, to me, it feels very much the Canadian version. And I think when he is assertive and the way that he fights against Justin Trudeau, all of those things I think are seen as being so different from Justin Trudeau, who kind of meanders around the point. Um, and so I, I think that that confidence in an environment where our economy feels so out of people's controls and people's own economic situations feel so out of, out of their controls, I think that like assertion does feel comforting but i think it's i think we can overstate a little bit the importance of the style and there's also the element of like attention and being someone that can communicate and communicate in a way that's a little different that maybe doesn't just sound like every other politician and i think pierre Polyev has a little bit of that as well i think he definitely does to me at least feel like he has the the very politician-y feel, but he does speak differently and he is more forceful. And a lot of that is, I think, reflective of how people talk about politics in their regular life. Um, like in some qualitative research that I had done, um, I had tested things that I thought were the worst examples of him being kind of a jerk in, in the house. And people didn't care. Um, and he realized how much, um, like how how much people aren't just like soft and perfectly professional and always using the right words in, in their own lives. And I think that's why, at least at this point in time, I, I think of eventually there will be a point 
where that rubs people the wrong way. But at this point in time, it's not really offending. And I think that's kind of the case for enough voters for Donald Trump as well. Um, I had read a quote earlier today of like a, a Hispanic woman. So that, that cl the classic example of like how are Hispanics voting for him? Um, and she had said something along the lines of like, Democrats always say the right words and they don't do anything. And Donald Trump doesn't have the right words all the time, but he does stuff. Um, and so I, I, I felt like that was very relevant to our kind of broader uh, political environment, both, both here and there. December is around the corner, Hurley Burleyites. And in the world of political commentary, you know what that means? It'll soon be the season of a year in reviews. Well, I'm going early. And there's no surprise here. Inflation is one of my top picks for 2024 because it has changed the game from politics and policy to the economy and consumer confidence. Our sponsor, Fidelity Investments Canada, does a lot of research on inflation and they want to share some data on how it's impacting Canadians' retirement security. Driven by the rising cost of living, the share of Canadians reporting a positive outlook on retirement is declining. Four in 10 say they'll have to retire later than originally expected. For those already in retirement, one in three say their income is not enough to maintain their pre-retirement standard of living, with six in 10 retirees adding that they support adult children financially. There is some good news though. Canadian pre-retirees and retirees with financial advice say that a written financial plan and investments make them feel better prepared for post-work life than those without those things. Not just financially, but emotionally, socially, physically. Given that, Fidelity would just remind you, consider getting advice, a plan and investment performance you can count on, because performance matters. But what I hear you saying, and David picked this up, what I hear you saying is that People are looking for strength, yes, and they're always looking for strength in leadership. But to the extent that people in the United States seem to want something more autocratic than we're used to, somebody who doesn't care about process, doesn't care about institutions, is just going to, by virtue of his own vigor, get it done, right? Um, and what I hear Kyla saying is that she doesn't think Canadians are really looking for that. Um, I, I'm... I'm not sure. I think there are some Canadians, maybe enough to elect a, a conservative government who, to use the you know, Canadian version, need a snowplow to just you know, push through and clear the way for them. Whether it's to buy a home, whether it's to afford their you know, life, to you know, just think of the four things that, that Pierre Polyev repeats over and over, and those are the things that people think are getting worse and they'd like to see improved. Um, so I do think there's, there's some of an appetite for that. I also think, though, that there's, this is, you know, um, Celinda Lake, a, a Democratic pollster, uh, Kyla, you probably know her, um, tweeted something the other day, or someone paraphrased her, and they said she was doing focus groups in the United States, and when you'd ask people, what's Trump's economic plan? They'd say tax cuts and, um, and, and deportations, immigration, right? And then they'd ask, what's, the, what's Harris's economic plan? And they said something like welfare, and then blah, 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 I don't know, it's not really clear, Right? What I think people are looking for today, in part because of the, the news media ecosystem that is a mess and fragmented, but also because it, it just works better, is simplicity and clarity. Right, David? And we, we, we're starting to do some polling with the logic. And we did this survey that befuddled me, but then proved the point that I think you've been making more than anybody else, which is when you ask Canadians, um, do you have a clear sense of what each of the parties and leaders would do if elected on the economy. And for a government that's been in office for 10 years, more people thought they ha had a good sense of what Pierre Paul and the Conservatives would do if elected than what Justin Trudeau and the Liberals would do. So as much as everybody can criticize Paul for not having details and a detailed plan, he's got clarity in a way that the Liberal government doesn't on how do you solve the fundamental questions that people are asking today. And I come back to the fact that Doug Ford has an answer um, and Tim Houston have answers. And that's why they are not yet being pulled down by what I described as this inflationitis. Hmm. Kata, you seem to be agreeing vigorously with that. Yeah, I, was just, I was just thinking, I'm like, oh yeah, this is an audio medium. You can't see how like vigorously I'm nodding my head in agreement, but um, totally like, well, 
you always want that. I think what uh, when when David taught me in the political management program, what we talk about is like the ballot question. When you go into the ballot box, what is the one thing that you're you want voters to think about? And they have to at least be able to fill in the blank. And I think a, a big part of the challenge of, of what we come or of, of what we see, and I think this was the case of the Harris campaign, is like what is that one thing and I think it would have been spread out across um you, you wouldn't have had that consistency of people saying that one thing for some voters it would be about, about abortion for some it would be you know whatever um but I just don't think it's that same degree of clarity and I think to back to one of your points about you know the U.S. they're looking for this kind of strong man I think part of the challenge in communicating about um the kind of threat to democracy type stuff is it, it is very hard for people to envision um, changes to institutions because one, they're not familiar with how their institutions work now. They're displeased with how they work generally. So I think it's kind of hard to pitch people on, Oh, Donald Trump is a greater threat to democracy than he was when he already was president. It's like kind of a convoluted story um, instead of going at just directly at the kind of economic point. And, and, you know, David, I'm a political scientist. And so, you know, I remember back in 2011, I was much younger. Michael Ignatia swept me off, you know, my feet with talk of, you know, democratic institutions and rebuilding the. But man, I thought this guy is going to fall flat because if he's going to rise up politics 101 lecture to Canadians, they're going to say, uh, no, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll just turn on, you know, uh, YouTube and, and watch what I really want to see. Right. So, okay, so we're agreed that economics is huge in all of this, but the ad that everybody's talking about in the aftermath of the U.S. election is the trans ad. Um, the ad where uh, the Republicans showed a clip of Harris talking in 2019 uh, when she was running for the Democratic nomination about how she thought that prison inmates who wanted to transition sexually should have that publicly paid for. Um, and the Republicans ran it and ran it and ran it and ran it. What impact do you think it had? Why did it have that impact? And would it work in Canada? Well, I think I in think the absence of what appears, or at least what we were told, and maybe we were wrong, and maybe everybody was wrong, of an of a effective turnout machine among Republicans, that might have been it that that one ad had the effect of consolidating the traditional Republican voter, that Christian conservative back in, and some of the, you know, more conservative, um, you know, uh, Hispanic and Latino voters, some uh, in the African-American community that wouldn't normally vote Republican were, were signaled with that issue, their, that their cultural conservatism was, 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 was signaled. So I think it's part turnout and part you know, speak to that uh, voter group uh, and move them away from economic focus or give them another reason to, to embrace Trump. So, um, and, you know, his, his, his record wasn't uh, on, on moral issues all that great. Well, I think there was a second part to that ad, which was basically like, Kamala Harris is for the they, them. And I think there was also a part of this being like taxpayer funded. And... Yeah. From the analysis that I've seen, it's that part of it that was the relevant part. I'm sure for some people that are like really uncomfortable with trans issues, that that was extra motivating. I'm sure that they were voting for Donald Trump anyway, but it's that like values alignment and focus that apparently was was ha that had the greater impact. And I think that sort of circles back to the broader America first theme. And you see this in, OK, they're going to spend taxpayer money on uh, uh, gender affirming care for, um, for convicts and they're going to send all your money to Ukraine and they're going to do all of these different things that are not about you at home struggling. And I think that is probably the part of the message that is kind of more relevant because I think from the research that I've seen, I've seen that there's also was sort of some backlash and also just like discomfort with the idea and the way that that issue was being used. Um, but I, I do think that the, the Harris is for the they, them 
whatever. The not you, I think, is the part that is relevant. Do you think Canadians would be comfortable with that explicitly um, divisive an advertisement? Hmm. I, um, I think my instinct wants to say no, but I think we are, we, I, I've come to learn that if we believe we are fundamentally different than everybody else, we're going to be proven wrong. We're still human. We have the same instincts. And as much as our social norms protect us uh, in a way that might not protect Americans, they've got different norms. Um, I think there's evidence that, uh, that it could work here. Um, it would be deeply offensive to a lot of people, but enough might say, hey, there's something here that maybe tells me something about the candidates that I didn't know. Yeah, yeah I, I think it depends on the example given, but I wouldn't say that that couldn't work. I think that there is a contingent of the Canadian ele electorate that is just like, of the view things are just getting a bit too weird and that is like one of their central grievances and, and a lot of things kind of circle back and, and refer back to that and their politics are very informed by that kind of general feeling. Right. I think the counter, the counter, the counter factual is whether that, again, this is what you asked David, whether that worked or whether it had a, made a difference in the outcome. I'm not sure because if that were the case, Scott Moe would have won a larger share of the vote in Saskatchewan and, and, Blaine Higgs would still be premier, right? That, that those are issues that were generally popular when you ask people about them, but didn't overcome, didn't allow them to overcome the fundamentals, which are, you know, bad microeconomic conditions hurt all incumbents. And, and that's why I still think that Trump was still the favorite. We should have, I'm like, I'm like your, your, your friend Scott Reed, kicking myself for not reminding myself the fundamentals matter and that that, that was still what we were, should have expected uh, last Tuesday. Yeah, the te tectonic plates were all moving in the wrong direction for Harris. Um, Israel Hamas. Israel Hamas, uh, it's, I think, generally accepted now that that may have cost Harris Michigan um, because of the turnout and the vote count in Dearborn, Michigan. I think Jill Stein got 15% of the vote in Dearborn or something like that. Um, Democratic turnout was down. I don't know, and maybe you do, what impact it had in the broader electorate outside of the uh, Muslim concentration in Dearborn there, whether it was an issue in the campaign, and if so, in whose favor? And does it, again, have the potential to be an impactful issue in the Canadian election? Kyla, do you want to start? Yeah. Um I was looking at some polling earlier today. We had tested a question exclusively of Harris voters that uh, basically was like a, an agree disagree of I am going to vote for Harris, but I don't agree with her position on Israel and Gaza. And it was a perfect 50-50 split um, of those with an opinion. It was a perfect 50-50 split between her voters. And those are people that were going to vote and were going to vote for her. I think of the, the missing 9 million votes. I'm not saying all of those were rel related to Gaza, but certainly um, for people that really cared, um, care about that issue, I think it just became very difficult for them to imagine how to participate in this um, two-party system given what is happening there. Um, so did that impact? Obviously, it Im impacted in third-party vote choice in certain areas. Um, but I also wonder, and, and it'll take time for us to know how many people stayed home because of that. Um, and also, it, it was a huge factor in, in, in even the bef before um, of impressions of uh, Joe Biden, and at that point in time, in, in our last polling um, in June, just prior to the debate, um, we had third parties at like 15% among people under 35. Like it, it was a huge factor. David? Yeah, I, I think, I think it, it may have contributed. I think in part, it, it, it's part of maybe the, the, the broader narrative around how Harris and, and Biden to some extent really did 
you know, it's the Bernie Sanders critique. They, they, on that issue and others, economic ones, they, they moved too far to the center, to the right. They weren't distinctive enough. Um, and, I mean, the U.S. position on Israel is, is one that's different than the Canadian um, perspective. But I think in Canada, I think there are hundreds of thousands of Canadians who are eligible to vote who care deeply about this issue on both sides. And is it sufficient to, 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 to affect the outcome of our election? Maybe in a close election like in the United States. Uh, will it matter if the Conservatives are 20 points ahead? Unlikely. Um, but if it does get more competitive, then um, to Kyla's point, in a multi-party system like ours, it creates more space for those voters to find a home. And, you know, with the New Democrats more on the, the Palestinian side and Conservatives really going all in on, on, on Israel, um, it leaves the Liberals, to, again, to be squeezed and, and be, um, which I think is the case for, for many people who care a lot about this issue, uh, deeply unsatisfying, uh, regardless of what position you take on this issue. Um, so so it, it could, but I just think right now the environment is one where it's not likely going to be determined here, but it could have mattered in the United States. Right. I guess one of the things that makes me curious about it, and it feeds into your theory, both of you, that the election was more about, that elections are more about punishing the incumbent right now, because there's literally no reason to believe that Trump will have a less supportive policy of Israel than Biden-Harris did, right? I mean, this is the author of the Muslim ban, and he's a friend of Netanyahu's. So they didn't, did they not know what the alternative was, or did they not care about what the alternative was? I think, I think, you know, I, I, I subscribe to the basic voter behavior theory that you vote for the party you think is best able to handle the issue you care most about. And if neither of them check a box at all, then if that's the issue that matters most, you will either sit out or go vote for a third party as a way to signal your, dis, your dissatisfaction with it. I think... We cannot exit, and for all your listeners and watchers, we cannot exit what I see every day, what we all see every day when we ask questions of Canadians, is just how, how lacking of context most people have, right? And so if the only thing that really matters in your life is this issue, then you probably aren't um, thinking about the consequence of it because you had so hoped that the person who was in charge and had the ability to, to influence the outcome didn't. And so it is much more about punishing that person and the person who followed them than it is about recognizing that the alternative could be way worse. Um, running out of time here, and I want to squeeze in a couple more quick ones here. And, and one of them is uh, Americans seem to be fatigued with funding the war against, uh, against Russia, with helping Ukraine in the war against Russia. And Trump was uh, unafraid to be clear that he was going to get America out of that entanglement as quickly as possible. Are Canadians feeling that same fatigue or can the Ukraine continue to count on Canadians to support governments who back them? I think, I mean, I haven't asked questions about this in a while, um, but there are indicators that there was, you know, over the last year, a softening of the resolve, I think, in public opinion to, to continue to back it. Not to the point where most are on the other side now. I don't think we're seeing that. And it's certainly not, there's some partisan hue to it, but not as deep as it is in the United States that, you know, uh, where Republicans and Democrats have been on uh, largely on opposite sides of that now for, for a number of years, particularly the elites in those two camps that are pulling their own supporters with them. Um, because we haven't had a political le leader in Canada really call for a fundamental change in our approach, I don't expect public opinion to shift too much on it. Um, I'm, I, I also believe that a lot of public opinion is simply constructed based on what the leaders of a, of a group tell it to do. And right now in Canada, um, we haven't seen much of it. So I, I, as long as that elite consensus more or less holds, I don't expect to see much change in, in public opinion there. I think it depends. I, I think the lens is different in the U.S. because they there is a feeling of fatigue with like um, America being kind of the, the central figure in the world, the like world's 
you know, whatever. Um, but so I, I think people just want a bit more or a lot more focus at home and to not be worried so much with global conflicts. We do not have that same position in the world. I don't think Canadians are as are, are thinking, oh, we're so involved in all of these important, you know, global struggles. And I think there's a bit of that, like, specific relationship with Ukraine and the history that we have. I will be very interested to see how attitudes change um, as, I assume, um, U.S. support dries up or declines significantly. And then to see do Canadians feel like that is like a rallying cry that that is now a time for us to do more or does it start to feel futile and I don't know um so I, maybe maybe opinion will stay the same maybe, I, don't, I don't really know I feel like that's one area that is kind of you know broader context dependent all right I want to make it I want to make it tangible for you Trudeau stands up tomorrow and says there was an additional 500 million dollar aid package to Ukraine do most Canadians say, bang on, put that Putin back in his box? Or do they say, where's my tax cut, you asshole, if you've got $500 million? Hmm. I think it depends what Pierre Polyev says. I really do. I think it, it, it matters a lot. I think, I think in, in, in a vacuum, David, I think your, your hypothesis is correct. They would say, where's, you know, we're always, our instinct is to actually always say, I'd rather you spend this money at home. We see it when we do research on uh, international development aid or any other kind of policy that's sending money elsewhere. Um, the instinct of people is, is self-interest to the most part. But um, there's also a, a recognition of the threat that Canadians do feel that Russia plays. And in, in light of, I think, an understanding that Trump is not going to likely be as, as a, a big player uh, in that kind of conflict, then I think Canada could, I think there's, there's, a, there's an audience for Canadians to be convinced that this could be a place we can have a role, even if it's, to Kyla's point, not something we're normally see ourselves as. As far as um, sending money to other places, I think Ukraine is like the most probably like sympathetic place. Like I, I think if we were saying that we are sending money for, I don't know, aid to another country, I, I think that you would get even more of that kind of pushback of like, well, where's my... How about if we went to the money? COP conference and announced a $2 billion fund for developing nations to reduce their emissions? Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, but here's the thing, David, and- People have to know that that promise was made. And the only way they would likely know is if somebody opposed it, right? And, and that's, the, that's, to me, the, the important piece of public opinion, that if, if Justin Trudeau announced tomorrow we were going to spend an extra half million, half billion dollars for Ukraine, and no one challenged it, no one asked him questions in the House of Commons, even if the media wrote endless stories about it, odds are 60% of Canadians wouldn't even know he'd done it. Right. And so it requires right. it requires some friction in order for public opinion, I think, to actually form around something like that. So, yes, we can hypothesize. But in the like in the world that we see, it requires some debate and some the other side to actually engage their own audience to, to, to oppose it. And that's what I think happened with immigration as an example. Yeah, it's also is that a lot of money? What are we spending now? You know, you can, whenever you give a figure to voters, they don't know how to put it in that context if you don't put it. So, uh, it, you know, maybe it creates backlash. Maybe it's a nothing response that kind of in between, I guess, what your two options that you gave us were. So my last question for you is going to be about media because a lot of people are forwarding around to me an article from the New Republic Uh that tries to explain this election almost entirely on media sourcing. Um, and that um, the people that voted for Trump were, I guess, uh, in, in the author's view, I guess, victims of a certain type of journalism. But let me put it more neutrally than that. So I watch regularly CNN. I'm not an MSNBC viewer. Um, but I watch regularly CNN and I read the New York Times and I read the Washington Post and I subscribe to the Substacks, I subscribe to whatever. In the, in the media I consumed, 
Harris was an exciting choice who was speaking to large and enthusiastic crowds um, and who won the debate decisively uh, and who was running a highly competent campaign. And in the media I consumed, Trump was an unrepentant asshole who was surrounded by the worst people on the planet. His campaign was laughably incompetent. People were walking out on his rallies, and he couldn't even draw them in by the end of the rally. And then he all culminated with a Nazi conclave in Madison Square Garden. Right? That's the campaign, literally, as it was presented to me. But I presume that many Americans, half or maybe more, saw a campaign that was the polar opposite of that, in which Kamala Harris was tied to everything shitty Biden had done and was, aside from those things, incompetent herself, and that she was totally tied up in all this woke business and et cetera. Okay? So to what extent is that true in Canada? Now, mm. we have the same decline in... Um, we have the same decline in, in mainstream traditional media penetration as the Americans do. We don't have really formats like Joe Rogan that reach vast numbers of people in Canada. I mean, I could put out an appeal for 20 million Canadians to sign up for the Hurley Burley, but that we don't we don't have that kind of thing. So it's not identically the same. But is it the case that two voters living in Burlington, Ontario, are consuming such different media that they can be understanding the truth of things completely differently? Um, I, I think some of it is different, but uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but I remember reading a report a couple of years ago that Canada is the greatest creator of right-wing misinformation per capita. And a lot of that, the intended audience is Americans, but a lot of that is here at home. And there definitely are a lot of people in this country that are not that they are not relying on the CBC. They are relying on different news sources, also different types of, um, you know, TikTok creators, social media influencers, just different types of kind of thought leaders. And they are, if you think of the World Economic Forum conspiracy theory, like that is not really niche in in Canada. So. Yes. Uh, and also there's a lot of um, like American creators that they like really hate Justin Trudeau. Um, so you can get content created in that way as well. I don't think it's quite the same as the U.S. because our politics is not, we do not have a Hollywoodification of our politics and it's just not as much of an entertainment source and, and uh, like, I don't know, Drake isn't going to be doing a campaign event with Justin Trudeau. Like a lot of it is just different. Um, but the world where we experience different elections is very real. That is even true of just ad placement um, and the types of digital ads that are being targeted to different voters. Like there's going to be a very different message and you can be completely blind or, or, or seeing a, a very different version of a campaign uh, from Pierre Polyev if you exist in... Well, this has always been the case of the existing Quebec versus English Canada, but also for different age, different demographic groups. Like, yes, the the one campaign is over. I think that's been true for a while. Yeah, if 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 Trudeau got Drake, Polyev would get Kendrick. <laughs> <laughs> you so useful <laughs> i know eh look at me i pulled that one right out there i got i got an lcd sound system reference wrong the other day so i'm feeling a little sheepish uh david yeah i i think it's i think it's different but actually the same and that's weird i think our uh our our, our mainstream media is not as partisan um certainly that's a, that's an obvious statement to say um but i do think that that the actual ecosystem has so fragmented that you can be somebody in Burlington across the street and experience a very different world entirely. And that is because of social media algorithms and, and all the things that you could be exposed to simply because you keep clicking on that content and engaging with it. Um, and so when I see data that I have that says one in four Canadians under 30 say their primary news source is TikTok, and 
Canadians over the age of 60, most of them don't know what TikTok is. It tells me that not only is there perhaps a partisan and ideological divide in our lived and perceived experiences, but a deep generational one. And so if you're under 30, your perception of the world and what's causing it and driving it could be entirely different than somebody over 60 who still tunes into the news at night, you know, and is a fan of Peter Mansbridge and listens maybe to his podcast than somebody who might actually be listening to Joe Rogan um, if you're under 30, but also just consuming an endless amount of YouTube and, and TikTok. So I think that, that yeah, it, it means campaigning is harder. It means us even being able to explain outcomes of an election, David. Like we, that's what we've been trying to do on this, this whole episode. And I don't think we can point to one thing that caused everybody to vote the way that they did. I think there's an over, overriding kind of anti-incumbent bias that exists, but might be driven by so many different factors that are ultimately influenced by my own interest that, that then causes me to become absorbed by it endlessly. And I don't have to escape it because I choose to live there. Right. So would you go so far as to say that media, different media might have played a role? Like did the right wing media ecosystem really drive Republican turnout and make people enthusiastic about the importance of this election? And did maybe Democratic oriented media have the opposite effect on their voters? And I, can I just give an example? And I don't know this to be true, but I saw this interview on CNN uh, on election day with a woman, must have been in her 20s, on like a campus, I think, in Arizona. And somebody went up to her and said, who'd you vote for? She said, Donald Trump. And they said, why? And she said, because he will not bring in a national ban on abortion. She said that. Now, that's just one case. We're, we're yeah. pollsters. You know, one case isn't, isn't generalizable. But I thought, just as you asked the question, does that young woman live in a household that watches Fox News? Because if she walks by the TV multiple times a day and hears Fox News say, Donald Trump's not going to make abortion illegal. He's, here's a clip of him saying, I will not bring in a ban. Then for that young woman who is maybe more informed by what her household is, 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 is watching, and if it's Fox News, then yeah, that absolutely informed her view than had she been watching Rachel Maddow on MSNBC for an entire election season. So I do think it has a big impact. It's framing the election in fundamental different ways. It's why I probably felt more bullish on Harris than I should have been because I consume, like you, David, the exact same media. I don't watch Fox News, and so I don't know um, what they're saying um, about the election that might have informed people in a different way. It might have given me better insights into what was happening. Yeah. Kyla, mm -hmm. should Harris have done Rogan? Or would it Absolutely. have made no difference? A thousand percent she should have done Rogan. I don't know okay. if it, would she have won if she had done Rogan? I don't know. Um, I think that it's not just Rogan, though. It's like all the podcasts doing media. She hadn't done an interview. And, and at the time, I was sort of persuaded by the like, oh, you know, journalists are being precious about her not doing interviews with them and she's doing other things that matter more to persuasion. Um, and there's part of me that still kind of feels like that. I don't think she should have been prioritizing the like New York times editorial board or whatever. Um, but I, I think a big part of Joe Rogan specifically, but also all of these kind of podcasters, a big part of, um, their appeal is just kind of people showing up and kind of being brave enough to have these conversations that go, you know, wherever. And I think that um, in a world where Democrats maybe seem like too pure in a way, you know, like they can't like get down in the dirt with regular people. They don't want to answer hard questions. They don't want to like, um, stoop to you know like to to the joe rogans or to the whatever i think it actually would have been very impactful for her to show up and show that degree of kind of bravery and i think a lot of people watched the uh trump's interview and were like oh what a failure this is doing joe rogan actually just did a huge gift to the democratic party because he was incoherent and he didn't make sense and in the eye of i think a lot of people that watched that interview which 
was had an enormous audience. It was like, well, he showed up and he had this conversation and, and then eventually Joe Rogan endorsed him. And I think that's the case for all of those different podcasts. It's like being willing to have conversations that would maybe make the most um, progressive democratic activists kind of uncomfortable, not necessarily in what they say, but in the platforms that they're working with. Um, and just as like progressives or, or liberals, we kind of have to figure out that, tension to you know maybe be a little less pure in who we're talking to um not not necessarily the voters that we're directing our message to but even just the platforms that we exist on and um yeah i i she absolutely should have done it i saw a a poll earlier today that this is probably overstated but it was a third of men 18 to 34 had watched the full they said that they watched the full rogan interview and a lot more that had seen clips or parts probably an over an over report but just the impact of that is just enormous and and the the alternative would be like harris's uh appearance on call her daddy they're like being framed as like alternatives not the same thing the audience sizes are completely different but yeah. Right. And, and, and David, like, you know, one of Harris's primary arguments was that Donald Trump is not in it for you. He's in it for himself. Right. And so implicit in that is that I respect you. I respect. But, but if I'm not willing to show up where you are, then that is a challenge to that. Right. And I think this narrative around I'm already judging you because you're there. Yeah, and therefore right. I'm not going to go and, and talk to you, right? which is why the Pete Buttigieg, I'm going to go on Fox News and fight with them may not convert anybody, but at least shows, says, hey, you respect me enough to show up on the place I watch. Because uh, many Americans may never have seen much of uh, Harris because she never appeared only in negative framing on the things that they watch. And so if you're going to run on being respectful and being there for everybody, I think you got to show up and, and, and be there for everybody at the same time. Great. Excellent. Thank you both so much. We've gone over time, but it was such an interesting conversation. And I appreciate you probably had to bend your schedules to do it. But it was such an interesting conversation. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, Really interesting. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, Forestry for the Future, and Fidelity Investments Canada. I want to thank all you Hurley Burleyites out there who watched or listened to the show. And of course, our guests again, Kyla and David. Come back next week. We'll have more Hurley Burley, but I doubt it'll be as good as this one. Sorry to say. See you then. Hurley Burley.